Majima, now formerly known as Ras Kuamba Jaini Balagoon. Okay, um, and tell us about this uh, this altercation with Valentine and how it, you know, what transpired afterwards. Well, he came into my office because I had another office called the St Paul's Local Development Agency, and that was sponsored by the Tory government. They gave me a hundred thousand pounds a year to establish black businesses. It was something that was supported um, by Prince Charles. It was his trust. Uh, and basically I was running that agency and I was assisting uh, young African uh, Caribbean men and women in establishing, you know, SMEs, small, medium enterprises. And um, I was in that office in between 85 and 87, I would say, one morning when Valentine Walker came in with a gun and started, you know, talking about, oh, you think you're the big boss in the area and I'm going to show you and all this kind of stuff and what have you. But he came in, he came in with his gun. I was sitting behind my desk upstairs and, you know, started waving the gun about, you know, what I'm going to do to you and all this kind of stuff and what have you. And then he left, you know. I, I called a friend and told a friend that, look, this guy just came up, blah, blah, blah. And... Um, you know, we decided, okay, you know, hold tight, sit tight, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. But well, didn't you not think, did you not think to phone the police? No, oh, come on. What would the police do? The police are the people who sent him. They sent him. <laughs> I called the police and told them what? The guy you sent to come and kill me has actually arrived. What would they do? They wouldn't do anything. The police were totally against me. So he came back, and he came back with a machete, which is a, a rather long light knife that is used in the Caribbean. It's used for weeding and what have you, have you, you know, it's used in Africa and stuff like that. And he made a swipe at me and cut my fingers because I put my hand up to protect myself. And then he made a, he, then he went again as if he was coming to hack me. And then he changed the stroke halfway through and pushed it in my throat. Uh, when he withdrew the blade, obviously a lot of blood just splattered out, and he ran out of the room saying, you can tell your friends, you can tell your friends, blah, 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 I'll be waiting. So anyway, to be honest with you, I, I travelled to uh, Northern Ireland, and they taught me a number of things, and one of the things they taught me is whenever you get a wound, just take it easy, don't start panicking, just take your time, cool the adrenaline down, so you can control the amount of blood that's going to leave your body. And that's exactly what I did. I took my time, I walked to the bathroom, I saw the extent of the damage, I held the, both the skin together at my throat and took my time and came downstairs and went to the shop next door and asked them to call the ambulance for me. And then I sat uh, on the windowsill there and just waited. Uh, the ambulance came in about three minutes uh, the nature of the cut was so severe that before I got to the hospital, they'd stitched it all up. Of course, they had the police coming around who did it, what was this, this and that, blah, blah, blah. And there was a lot of pressure because I had the locals in the community saying, don't say anything, we'll deal with it on our own. I had, the, you know, the politicians from the Labour Party saying, you must be seen to be using the system and the system must be seen to be assisting you. So don't deal with it on your own. Tell the police everything. And, uh, you know, it was it was a very traumatic time. Um, I was released from the hospital. I don't know how much stitches I had. The friends came round, politicians came round. We all had a talk. And I tried to uh, make a compromise by by doing both things which was telling the police eventually who it was, and then also trying to deal with it on my own. Um, I told the police, um, and Valentine Walker didn't waste any time. Uh, he left the country and went to Jamaica, and, and he stayed there throughout the entire trial, because uh, there was a trial. And um, What, you mean his uh, own trial? So he was on trial even though he was in Jamaica? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think he must have turned up once to court or something. 
and I, I told the court that yes, this is the guy that did it. And uh, was he at any point was, arrested? He, yeah, he was arrested. He was eventually arrested. He was arrested, and that's how we, you know, the charges came up against him and what have you. But at the end of the day, he probably attended court once or twice, and then he fled to to Jamaica. And in his absence, he was found not guilty. And it was determined that I cut my throat myself and blamed it on him because I was saying he was a police informer. Now, that was totally, absolutely unbelievable. But that's the way it went. You know, one had to accept it like that. Soon he was back in the community doing what he was doing. I was still there doing what I was doing as well. And uh, I, I just had to live with it like that. I mean, did you did you pass him in the street, that sort of thing? No, not often, not often. He travelled with, he, he moved around with a couple of other guys. Um, and on one occasion that I was going to sort something, sort something out, something else happened and it deterred the whole thing. So basically, he got away with that. And, uh, you know, I've just had to live with that. I mean, it's, so it's what, what with the introduction of cocaine and this incident as well, which seems like on the surface anyway is a miscarriage of justice, how did that affect, um, you know, this, the cohesion of the community in St Paul's? Well, the cocaine totally destroyed the cohesion in the community, totally destroyed, because we hadn't known anything about that before. We were just smoking cannabis. That, that was about it. So I mean, how does the drug affect people in a political way? Well, they began to feel that there was no hope. There was no point pursuing things politically at all. Uh, they even told me they felt I was barking up the wrong tree. It would be a waste of time and, and good energy. No one was going to listen to you. No one's going to take you seriously. No one was going to address the issue of poor housing, poor education, poor health care, you know, lack of employment, lack of recreational facilities. No one was going to address those things anymore uh, because nobody cared. All they wanted for us was to be locked up in, in Lockley's prison. And that's what was happening. And when the cocaine came into the community, it swiftly turned people against each other because once people got hooked on it, that was it. They were selling everything just to get a hit. They were taking a rock on credit, stuff like that. And when they couldn't pay, then whoever you took it from came down on you like a sledgehammer coming to smash a nut. So the cohesion was totally destroyed, totally destroyed. People became disillusioned once again, apathetic once again, and they didn't realize that they had a reason for living. So it, it was very, very bad. It was a very, very bad situation. And I don't believe that St. Paul's has even recovered from that because we've had a lot of black-on-black -black violence. We've had uh, a lot of people who've been killed and, and what have you. And, you know, the area has been gentrified now and black people are being driven from St. Paul's because it's, it's next door to the town centre and, Black people essentially have been dispersed and they congregate now in pubs here and there and what have you. And the type of cohesion we had back in the early 80s, I don't think that will ever return to St. Paul's again. I see some of my colleagues on, you know, on their Facebook pages. I see the stuff that they're doing. You know, Lawrence Hu, Jen Dai, Sewa, quite a few people, they're, they're doing stuff. It's not as it was before. I can feel it from here. It's not like it was before at all. What we had there was strong. It was firm. It was unified. We spoke with one voice. I was the leader. Yeah. Now there's multiple leadership going on over there. You've got the St. Paul's Festival Committee, which is in disarray. The Ink Works is just its not what it used to be before. Docklands. Uh, you know, I mean, all these community spaces that we used to occupy and organize ourselves from, they're totally destroyed. They're not what they used to be.